So my name is Stefan Feistel from AFMG. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, one of our technologies, Firmaker, um, which allows beam steering, line array systems, if you like. And a particular implementation was done together with KRA. Who has already heard about Firmaker at all? Okay, almost, almost everybody. Okay, today we will go a little bit more into the details. Uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to interrupt me if you have a real question. Um, I think we can keep this a uh, very easy talk. It's a small audience, should be no problem. Okay. Firmaker, enhancing line array performance by simulation. I will explain a little bit more later on why by simulation. But first, let's look at what we want to speak about. Uh, I will give an introduction into sound system design, in particular numerical optimization as a technique to arrive at good sound system designs. Um, I will introduce Firmaker as one particular solution developed by us. And I will show some simulation examples first, and then I will show some, uh, some field measurements to, to demonstrate how much you can achieve with, with this system. So let's start with an introduction into numerical optimization. Now, when I talk about optimization, let's be clear. I don't mean uh, sound quality or um, frequency curves, right? What I mean is the, the, the mathematical optimization, something that's mathematically defined in contrast to what many of us understand as optimizing a sound system where often subjective things play a role too. We only talk about the objective part here. Yeah? Okay, so what kind of goals do we have? I'm sure you all know that just to recapture. Um, we want to achieve complete coverage with a good sound system design. We want to have maximum uh, high maximum levels and a good signal to noise ratio. We want to achieve uh, very high levels. Um, a smooth frequency response throughout the venue, however it may be shaped. An efficient design becomes more and more of interest, not only on the, with regard to how many pieces do I have and how, how does it work regarding truckloads and so on, but also uh, green aspects play a role. How much power do I need uh, and so forth. Uh, dynamic range and latency is of course important too. Uh, our, our main um, discussion here will be about the first three points really. Okay, now we've listed all of these different aspects and in the last years, really since the last 10, 15 years, uh, more strongly, we have seen an, an, uh, an emerging of new types of uh, loudspeakers, of new types of sound systems, primarily based on loudspeakers placed in arrays, mostly linear arrays or curved arrays. And on the one hand, we have uh, those let's call them mechanical line array, and I have put the K array here in between, even though it's uh, a little bit more advanced actually, but mechanical line arrays, and then we have the uh, also well-known digitally steered uh, columns, where the, 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 the coverage is achieved not primarily by uh, mechanical uh, splaying, but uh, by means of electronic filtering, yeah. delay tapering, for example. Okay, so portable line arrays are often used in uh, live concert sound. Um, mechanical steering is applied. But the more advanced implementations use amplitude shading, frequency shading. There is, the flexibility is limited. Not much steering uh, beyond the mechanical aiming. And there's some work effort involved, flying the thing assembling it, bringing it down, and so forth. That's, of course, always uh, a big question, a big time consumer. Digitally steered columns are primarily used in installed sound. They use 
primarily delay to beam steer, to steer the sound down to the audience, for example. They also use amplitude and frequency shading. The most um, well-known uh, approach is that you try uh, to shorten the array at higher frequencies by means of electronic filtering so that you get fewer side lobes. Um, then we have beam steering limited power. Uh, the, the system is limited in its output capability more than the, the portable line arrays. Okay. So both of these systems have emerged and make largely now use also of DSP power, of large amounts of DSP power actually. They are very powerful, very flexible, but because they are so flexible, you can do a lot of things and you can do a lot of things wrong as well. Yeah. So they need to be configured correctly. And that's where we come into play at AFMG, we are developing modeling software, measurement software for audio and acoustics. Probably all of you have heard about Ease or Ease Focus or SysTune, other programs of ours. And uh, when you want to employ such complex line array systems, it is most often needed that you uh, run um, a simulation upfront to check what results do you get before it is realized. It's much more expensive, of course, to, to, to bring up your line array system five times to try out how it works, rather than using a computer software to check what, what splay angles you, you need to use or what boxes. You can analyze existing installations very easily. You can uh, optimize equipment and cost by, mean, by means of the simulation software. And you can uh, uh, use our tools also, of course, as a uh, sales tool is a little bit uh, low-level word, but it is a way to communicate results to the client, and that's really important. All of you know what SPL means, but out there, 95% uh, of the people don't know this. And if you say, okay, we have, a, we have not enough SPL here, people do often not understand this. What they understand if they if they see a nice um, red or yellow map with some blue or black holes, then they will understand. Okay, here I cannot hear anything. Uh, so that's I, I have put it very simply. But we often face this also with our uh, users that they want to communicate certain problems in the system design or in the in the in the acoustic environment. So that's that's what our tools are good for as well. And uh, our tools are very well known, and uh, there are a few things that compare to it, really. Okay, so that's the simulation part. Now, when we use simulation software, very often this sort of process is applied, this sort of approach. Meaning, you enter your room, your venue, you insert some sound sources, and then you simulate what you would get in the audience, SPL distribution, and so forth. Now you first configure the system, you compute the results, and then you compare, do I get what I, what do I, uh, what I want to get? Now, usually at the first try, you don't match your requirements immediately. So you start over, or you do modifications and run again, and so forth. And that's what we called here the forward methodology, uh, very commonly used, but it's also known as trial and error, time consuming at best. Yeah? If you have experience, you're a little bit faster, but it's a lengthy progress. Now, what would be if one was able to uh, define the requirements for the, the venue, for the audience that you want to achieve, and then the the software uh, would do its calculations and provide you with a system configuration that you should be using. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? You could uh, define, for example, requirements relating to uh, the desired coverage, target SPL, or the smoothness. 
and the software could compute the parameters of the system automatically in order to achieve or come close to the desired uh, results. Uh, and that's in part future talk really, but we are strongly moving into that direction. And uh, one implementation is now done with Firmaker, but I want to explain here a little bit this backward process in more detail. And that's what we call numerical optimization, namely how the software computes based on some input parameters, based on uh, goals, the, the, the optimal configuration of the sound system. Yeah. So what's, what's the input data for this process? This is here all happening in the, in the software side, in the optimization algorithm. The input data is the venue geometry, okay, audience areas, but also the, the, the boundaries. Then the sound sources and certain design goals. And then the algorithm takes a start configuration runs an acoustic simulation, checks if it matches our requirements, and if not, it takes another test configuration by varying the original configuration. So you as a user can do these runs maybe one per 10 minutes, whereas the computer can do maybe 10,000 runs per second or so, which of course gives us a huge advantage in, in this uh, iteration scheme. So let's talk a little bit about the, the details here. The test configuration um, that's manipulated, the sound system configuration that's manipulated inside the, the model, this could be display angles, this could be where the array is hanging, this could be the type of boxes we are using, this could be certain filter settings, all of this could be configured. The acoustic simulation is done, meaning SPL distributions throughout the audience. And then an objective function is computed. An objective function, that's a, um, a term from a numerical mathematics, um, it describes the, the quality of the SPL distribution in our case uh, as a single number, as a single number. Yeah. For example, if we are looking for uh, high SPL uniformity, what would be the objective function? It could be the standard deviation. The standard deviation across the audience will get lower and lower the more uniform the sound field is. Right? So, the objective function is a single value that's computed of all of the output data for a given test configuration. And the, the algorithm, it's stupid, it's not like, like us, we can look at the, the, the output or the results and have, a, have an idea of the whole picture. The computer needs a, a yes-no decision. So, what it does here is for any test configuration it calculates the result of the objective function, for example standard deviation, and checks if it's better than the previous result and it also checks if it's as good as or better than what we asked for. And once this goal is achieved we have a final configuration. Yeah. So that's uh, the general principle of numerical optimization. You could uh, also look at uh, radio transmitters or uh, any anything really, shapes of ships. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of examples where numerical optimization is used in, in engineering. Uh, that's uh, science developed since uh, maybe 50, 60 years. That's nothing so new, but its application to the, to the audio world is relatively new. And uh, in particular, uh, in our case, with the background of simulation software. Oh, I can do it like this. Okay, so the objective function, we already have talked about this quite a bit, uh, can, for example, quantify the evenness of the coverage, uh, but it could also 
include the SPL that can be achieved, even a combination of both with a certain weighting. I will get back to this a little bit later. And also other aspects can be included, a frequency response, exclusion zones, or a defined uh, target response. Certain parameters can be changed or must be changed. Those establish the configuration that we are manipulating for the purpose of optimization. And those could be splay angles or delay or gain. And in the case of Furmaker, we are not doing that, but we are uh, deriving the optimal FIR filter configuration. Everybody knows what FIR filters are. Anybody who doesn't know? Okay, FIR, Paul. FIR filters, <laughs> FIR filters are not new in signal processing and also not that new in, in audio, but uh, they are very powerful and very, um, 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 yeah, they put on a high CPU load if you like. So they haven't been used much, they haven't been implemented much. But with the, with the increasing uh, availability of CPU power during the last years, look at your mobile phones, they can do what uh, a PC couldn't do 10 years ago. Um, more computing power is available even to the audio world, to loudspeaker products. So FIR filters can now be implemented very easily. And what do they do? FIR filters basically are a way to manipulate magnitude and phase of a signal path in very high detail. Yeah, in very high detail. IIR filters, you only have three or four degrees of freedom knobs where you can play, whereas FIR filters, if you have an FIR filter of uh, 1,000 uh, taps, uh, you have 1,000 numbers that you can choose uh, to manipulate the, the magnitude and phase response of your signal. So very powerful, very flexible, uh, but requires some uh, computing power in the back. Okay, so because this is now possible and has become available, uh, we have uh, worked on Firmaker. One inspiration was KRA for this work, and uh, FIR filters are a, a very powerful way into the future. I will show this in a few slides. Okay, how does it work once we, uh, when, when we uh, use these FIR filters? Well, basically, uh, with Filmmaker, the user first has to put in the venue, for example, in his focus, then he runs the optimization with his given uh, goals, and FIR filters are calculated from that, and they are uploaded into the DSP software. And of course, this signal processing is then applied to the sound system, and you can, oh, sorry, you can listen to it. Okay. So, um, in the case of the the KRA KH8, this is kind of of an op, uh, automatic process, because the DSP and the AMPs are already uh, embedded into the system, and the software can talk directly to the, the DSP. But there are also various DSP platforms like BiAMP or XTA or others where you can feed in FIR filters on your own. So um, with regard to Firmaker, there's a, uh, the possibility to use other systems as well. Okay, so here's a screenshot of Firmaker implementing those different um, parameters. Here on the right hand side you can see a block of, of, of those different settings. Uh, you can choose for each uh, audience area whether there's actual audience, it should be, sh sound should be sent there, uh, or this audience area should be avoided, meaning no sound should be sent there uh, at all, or it should be ignored for the purpose of the optimization. Then uh, optimization priorities can be set where basically you can define the balance between the different um, aspects yeah? like high uniformity, high power or strong avoidance. Yeah? 
you can put an emphasis on this. In the objective function, imagine this, that each term of this objective function has its own weight, and you can emphasize one aspect over another. Uh, of course, there's a compromise always. Cannot have everything at once. Yeah, you can choose the level distribution over the audience, okay, whether you have a certain decay or you have a, a constant SPL from the front to the back row and so forth, and more detailed settings down here. And here there's a channel assignment, which is not so important for the KH8, but for other systems you can uh, assign um, how many FRR channels you use for your system. Okay. Moving on, this was the, the general introduction into numerical optimization. I think that wasn't too hard. There's lots, lots, lots of textbooks about it if you feel inclined to study this in more depth. It's quite an interesting topic, really. Um, and we, we are sure this will uh, accompany on us uh, also in the future. So now let's look at some calculation examples just to get an idea first, and then we will we'll look at some uh, field studies. Okay, here on the, the purely simulation side, we want to see the effect of Furmaker um, for a flown line array and for a digitally steered column. Here's an example from East Focus. This is a system, I believe, of 12 boxes, uh, fairly large size. This is about four and a half meters high. And we've simulated this and optimized this with Furmaker. Um, with one FRR channel per cabinet, not five, not ten, not twenty, one. The throw distance is about 100 meters here to the back rows, and it was mechanically aimed in advance. So, what are the results that we get? On the left hand side, you can see the regular result without FRR filters and without Furmaker optimization. Okay? at 500 hertz, an octave band, and we have computed here the average level plus minus the standard deviation across the, uh, the, the audience. Uh, and you can see here the level distribution versus distance at this 500 hertz octave band and the level uh, on the y-axis. Okay, that's a very typical display at 500 hertz. You have quite some beaming. Uh, you don't always get the sound where you want it to, um, but you can't play it anyway, so there's a, really a compromise. Whereas with Furmaker, um, you can achieve very uniform coverage throughout the audience. You can see it here, because now with FIR filters, the, the, the sound is redistributed, but also the superposition of the individual line array cabinets is changed, how they interact at, at the... Uh, at the receiving places. And of course, uh, we get an average SPL that's a little bit lower. Why? Because we have chosen to optimize for very high uniformity. Now, plus minus 0.2 dB seems artificial to you, right? In practice it is, but in the simulation world we can of course be uh, very accurate. And I'm, I, I just show these figures here to show um, yeah, how, how uniform things can be, uh, how, how far the, the algorithm uh, can reach. Okay, so in this case we have optimized for very high uniformity but taken a loss on the, the, the average SPL, but you can see here this uh, flat line, this is 104 dB, 160 dB, 180 dB, so this is really very uniform, very nice. Very similar picture at 1K. Here we have a little bit of a beam split up in the conventional case, which helps a bit with level distribution, but still the standard deviation across the venue is 2.3 dB, and when we optimize for very high uniformity, we get down to 0.2, very flat level distribution again. At 2 kilohertz, it's even better. Um, same picture here, we have a, a lot of inhomogeneity, well, a lot, that's maybe a yeah, scale of 5 dB here um, for the conventional system. And with Furmaker, it's very smooth. Now you may say, oh, that's all simulation. That looks far too good. I won't get this in reality. But I have some field studies later on to, uh, to give you uh, measurement results as well. 
Okay, and at 4K, we start losing control, very typical. Um, side lobes start to emerge and so forth. We get little ripples in the optimized response and also the, the conventional response looks a little bit more jacked. Okay, now we've lost level in basically all octave bands. What does it mean? Maybe we shouldn't optimize for high uniformity only, but uh, consider level as well a little bit more. And this can be done uh, by means of the tools that, I shown, that I've shown earlier by adjusting the balance between the different aspects of the uh, objective function. Here's a plot at one kilohertz octave band for that system again with no optimization. And uh, here's a plot that we already looked at, very smooth distribution of level, very high uniformity, but then you can choose another weighting. For example, you could optimize for very high SPL. Yeah. Then you get almost 1 dB more output, but the spread of level across the audience is also higher. Uh, it's not magic. There's a trade-off always. Yeah. You can't be... Uh, uh, you can't be a beauty and wealthy at the same time normally. Uh, so, and there's a, then there's maybe a good compromise somewhere with a uniformity that's uh, reasonable in practice, maybe also plus minus one dB or so, which is absolutely acceptable, and then maybe a level that's almost the same as uh, in the conventional case. So this gives you really some control. I mentioned all of that already. And now let's look at the steered uh, column. This is a very typical case, um, a two meter high steered column, like you maybe know them from Tenoy, uh, from uh, Renko Science, from Duran, from other companies. Um, often you have 16 drivers distributed along the length and in this case we've simulated with 16 FRR channels and we've taken a very typical setup here uh, with the floor area and uh, a balcony and uh, the conventional system our reference system was configured with two beams which is also very typical for digitally steered columns. So what do we get at 500 Hertz? For the conventional system there isn't you can't really recognize that there are two beams yet um, 77 dB plus minus 2.6 dB, okay. Fairly controlled. A little bit better with filmmaker optimization at 500 Hertz. Maybe the column is also not quite long enough to fully exploit this, but then at 1 kilohertz, for example, we get really good results now. Uh, we have quite some spread in the level uh, for the conventional system, 76 dB here in this case and some uh, dynamics, whereas with filmic optimization it's much more uniform and we even achieve higher levels. Uh, similar pattern at 2 kilohertz, higher uniformity, higher levels, very nice, and the same at 4K. 64 versus 68.9, 5 dB spread because of the side lobes and so on and here it's just 1 dB. Okay, so digitally steered columns, we can improve the radiation pattern quite a lot because we can make it more directional than in the conventional case. Um, received SPL is higher or similar to the conventional system and the, the, the uniformity is higher as well. Uh, and also here we can of course play with the different the terms of the objective function, for example, maximum SPL versus uniformity. Okay, let's look at some case studies now, and that will be the, the last part. Uh, we have prepared three different uh, case studies, and I presented them already a year ago or so. Um, a line array and a medium size hall, a steerable column on a rotator, and a line array in a large sports arena. Now what have we done there? Why is this different to the previous? We have also done the simulation up front, but then we've exported FIR filters as they've been optimized 
and we've put them in the sound system in reality and we've measured the result in reality. Yeah? And compared the conventional system in reality with the Firmaker optimized system in reality. Okay, so the first um, case here is the, is the line array in a medium size hall. This is actually, we are here in such a surrounding too, it was a creative uh, environment here too. This is a, a movie, um, movie recording uh, hall, really, where they build up big scenes and so on, um, where we had a lot of uh, good possibilities to hang stuff and to, to, to shape the environment. So there's a, um, a line array of eight boxes, um, mid-size, uh, hanging here centrally. And to get an impression of the, the, the size, here's the guy running the measurements. It's the computer screen. And it's not a 55 inch, it's a 32 inch or something like that. Yeah. And there's a microphone array that we've used for the measurements because we did uh, 100 measurement positions over uh, a length of 26 meters. The hall, I believe, is 35 meters long or so, and uh, we uh, had very small steps that we measured to get a very detailed impression, and we did this for many different setups. So uh, doing multi microphone measurements is, of course, a good way to go. The optimization goal, goal was that we want to have a smooth frequency response across the hall, meaning from the very front rows to the very back rows over the full bandwidth of 60 hertz to 16 kilohertz. We used one FIR filter per cabinet, eight in total. And here are the results. This is the system without Firmaker still. And let me explain this plot. You may, maybe you have not seen this kind of plot before. Um, at the bottom, we show the frequency in hertz. And on this axis, we move away from the array. Okay, this is the front row, and this is the back row. So the frequency response color coded, if you like. Yeah, this is the scale for the color, meaning blue is kind of minus six, minus eight off from the average of zero dB. Zero dB is green, and red is kind of 8 dB off from the average in the other direction. Yeah. So frequency response across the hall. So what we see here, now interpretation, um, is very typical, really typical for line arrays. We have in the low frequencies, we have a point source behavior. This decays very nicely towards the back of the hall. In the mid-range, we have the beaming in the middle of the hall. And in the high frequencies, we have all of the side lobes close to the array. Uh, once you got used to this kind of plots, it's very helpful, very instructive to understand how the system works. And we've plotted here the standard deviation versus frequency. That's basically the average from front to back. Yeah. And the standard deviation is about 2 to 3 dB in the mid-range. Here the green area is plus minus 1 dB around the average. And uh, the yellow and bright blue is uh, about minus 2, minus 3. Uh, that's the major part. So we have 2 to 3 dB standard deviation. And it rises towards the lower and lower, towards the higher frequencies. Now, if we look at the Firmaker optimized case, and that's now measured with simulated FOR filtered, but measured in the field. We have a completely different build, uh, picture. Almost everything is green. What does it mean, everything is green? Well, that means that almost all of the, the, the levels are within plus minus one dB of the average. Yeah? Back of the hall, front of the hall, very close to the array, we still have at the 8K and upwards, we still have some, something going on, but the rest is very well controlled. And you can see it here in the, uh, the standard deviation across frequency. This is, this is the 1 dB line, and we've measured, we've measured 
a standard deviation that's below 1 dB at 500 to about 2K. Yeah? When you walk the hall in the mid-range, you could not hear a difference where you are. Consistent, res consistent response over 25 meters, very low standard deviation, effective up to 8 kilohertz. You can see here 8 kilohertz, we are at 3 or 4 dB, and here we are already in the 4 to 5 dB. So also the control extends into the very low frequencies, into the very high frequencies. Okay. That's all on axis, yeah. For a line array that has a, a vertical arrangement of drivers, the only plane of control is the vertical domain. So we can't affect anything in the horizontal domain. Now, if we had a horizontal array, we could look at this. If we had a 3D array, we could look at this too. But right now, this is basically a representative uh, of the system and it doesn't change in the horizontal domain. It can't change. We can't modify its radiation characteristics. Yes. There is no interaction, basically. Yeah. 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 Okay, good question. That's also a question for the guys from Italy, for example. I think they already think about this. <laughs> Let's move on. Second example, also very interesting. Um, this was a collaboration with, with Anselm Goertz. Um, some of you may have heard about him. He does loudspeaker measurement quite frequently, but he's also an acoustic consultant and a user of our products. And uh, we did one, uh, one measurement together here, in this case, with a with a steerable column, um, very typical again, uh, 16 channels. Um, and we measured one degree steps all around in an anechoic chamber because we wanted to check, uh, not just for a flow line array, but for a steerable column, how much of a beam steering can we do? How, how good does it, how well does it work? Yeah, and uh, the optimization goal was here not to have a very a uniform uh, distribution of SPL, but to have a, um, a very uh, constant uh, beam width. Yeah. For example, in this case, we define plus minus 45 degrees. We want to have 90 degrees uh, beam width. And here you can see the results. Again, similar plot as we've seen before, frequency response frequency on the x-axis and the y-axis now doesn't show the distance from the array but the, the angular uh, axis. Uh, this is on axis and probably you have seen these plots before uh, for, for arrays. It's very typical. They, the, the beam width narrows for higher frequencies and this is plus 45 and minus 45 and of course the standard deviation is all over because of the, all of these uh, lobing effects. Now, when we apply filmmaker optimization to this, to this uh, digital column, um, it gets green again, very nice, within plus minus 1 dB almost. We have very smooth uh, distribution of level within those plus minus 45 degrees. Yeah, so we have a, a very uh, controlled beam um, in the on-axis direction. Now you may say, oh, but you are not showing pictures for the of axis directions, what's happening at 46 degrees or at 90 or at 180 degrees, right? So here's a picture for the, for the full um, balloon. 180 degrees, that's the back, to minus 180, uh, the back again. Uh, that's the bottom, that's the top. You can see here again the, the narrowing of the beam, the conventional case, and with filmmaker optimization, um, we have very controlled beam within those plus minus 45 degrees. We do not have sound spilled uh, beyond that significantly. And also the rearward uh, radiation is suppressed strongly. Very nice. 
Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead. Last example, also quite interesting. Um, this was a measurement done in the southern part of Germany in collaboration with DNB. Um, they provided here this system, uh, a V-series system of 16 cabinets, medium to small size, really very nice. Um, and uh, we've used one FRR filter per cabinet. And the goal was again to achieve a smooth frequency response across the hall, but it would be boring if everything was the same as I showed before. So here the, the interesting new part is we also define the stage area below the array that we wanted to avoid, where we didn't want to put sound. Okay. 140 measurements were done along the hall, 70 meters throw, half meter spacing of the measurements. And first uh, I want to show you the, the accuracy of the simulation. This is modeled with our loudspeaker GLL data. Same map as you've seen it, frequency response, color coded with level uh, from front to back, 70 meters, modeled and measured in the hall. Uh, very close, almost within 1 dB. So the simulation results are very close to the actual measurement results. Has nothing to do with Firmaker yet. However, because Firmaker is doing the optimization in the modeling world, it relies 100% on the accuracy of the simulation results. If the simulation results are wrong, the FRR filters will be wrong and they won't do any good in practice. I think that's clear. Yeah, we have to have a very accurate simulation as a, as a basis. Okay, all the measurements are windowed measurements on the ground plane, mm -hmm. generally. That was no problem because in all cases the side walls were far away. But, but, <laughs> we have given uh, dozens of papers on what to consider uh, when you do uh, simulations and particularly when to model loudspeakers. And you cannot expect to be much closer than this in reality. Because uh, one thing is, is the system angled exactly 0.1 degree? Are the splay angles, mechanical splay angles, exact to maybe 0.1 degree? Hardly possible for a large system. What's the spread between the loudspeaker boxes? These are 16 individually manufactured boxes, whereas in the simulation we only have one data set, right? So there are numerous little factors that contribute to this. In our view, if you do everything right, if you do everything really well with the loudspeaker data, with the simulation, you can be within 1 dB accuracy. And that's very good. 1 dB is approximately the difference that we can hear. Uh, some educated people can hear a little bit more, but the simulation are, is roughly within what we can hear as a tolerance anyway. So the question is if we really need to go far beyond this. Okay, it would be hard at least. So let me show the the, the Firmaker results for this case as well. Now that's the conventional case again. You see here the standard deviation. Even though it's a nice system, no surprises, quite well controlled. Of course we have a decay over distance and there's some some things are going on between the lows and the highs. Uh, there's a standard deviation. Whereas if we optimize for uniform coverage, we get a very nice green plot again from 200 to 13k in this case. Green is within plus minus 1 dB and the standard deviation is within 1 dB from about 400 or so to up to 3k. And even at 13k, even at this sort of wavelengths, we still have good control. As yeah, so you see here, we are down to 3 dB compared to those 6 to 7 dB here in the conventional case. One FIR filter per cabinet. Smooth coverage, consistent response over 65 meters, lower standard deviation, effective up to 13 kilohertz. But now the exciting part. Now let's look at the stage. So what we've done here is 
we've said let's define um, part of the venue uh, as a stage area and I've shown this, let me jump back very briefly, I've shown this here so far we've only looked at this plot yeah? but now we also look at this part of the coverage and here's uh, the defined stage area okay so front rows empty area stage area and what we want to do is we want to get a smooth response here again but we want to reduce the level on the stage as much as we can let's say very uh, strong uh, case here and with Filmmaker you can do that you can get really a huge cleanup in the stage area with the optimization goal set only a, a small notch remains here at 1.3 kilohertz or so but the rest is reduced in level quite a lot compared to here and some of the stuff is squeezed into the, the uh, empty area where we have no optimization goals and of course the coverage of the, uh, the venue itself is compromised to some extent. It's not bad but we can't have everything at once. Yeah? We cannot have suppression of sound radiation into the stage area entirely and at the same time expect the same smoothness of frequency response as we have without of all of the stage considerations. Yeah. So there is a balance to be found. It's no magic, it's all physics here. Yeah. But it's amazing what you can achieve. We have an average reduction, it's given in one of our AS papers, uh, of 5 or 6 dB. Yeah. 5, or six, 5, 5 or 6 dB more gain before feedback. I believe that's uh, quite interesting for many applications. Okay, and maybe as an outlook, in room acoustics it's often also important to look at speech intelligibility. And we've looked at this uh, sports arena, and let me jump back once more to the, to the photo. This is called Glas Palast in, in, in German, I believe. Uh, the glass arena, because it has large amounts of glass, and it's quite reverberant. Uh, two to three seconds. Not too bad, but reverberant. So it's interesting to not look only to not only look at the direct SPL. You can see it here. Filmmaker optimized SPL is much more uh, homogeneous at 1K than the conventional one across distance. But also to look at STI. Yeah, STI is very roughly speaking a measure of early energy or direct uh, sound, early arrivals energy versus reverberation, very roughly speaking. Um, and if you get a more homogeneous direct field, you get a more homogeneous in speech intelligibility. That's clear because the reverberation is basically the same everywhere, right? So, and why does that help us? Because the standards, they ask not just for the average SDI, which actually in this case isn't much improved by Firmaker, but the average STI minus standard deviation. Yeah, to uh, have a number that uh, quantifies basically kind of the worst case in the venue. Or the, yeah, the, the largest part of the venue is, is covered by this number. And that number is greatly increased because our standard deviation has become so small. So now the average STI minus its standard deviation is higher than before. And this could be the, the, the turning point here, 0.56 and 0.54 in the STI that can be a go or no go. Yeah. Yes, not ear height. But it's just an illustration. I think uh, the, the point is made. Okay, so we come to the summary. Uh, that's kind of an outlook here, DSP integration. Um, when we have calculated these FIR filters with Filmmaker, 
uh, we can either load and save them, we can save them to load them into a DSP software, which is not very comfortable, can take time, you can make mistakes, um, but it's commonly available because many, many DSP platforms already support loading in FIR filter files. But with uh, KRA and PowerSoft, uh, we um, implemented a first direct transfer of FIR data. So if you optimize um, a KRA system in EaseFocus and you calculate FIR filters, you can send them directly to Ammonia. Uh, you don't have to save files, load files. There you can uh, uh, not so easily make mistakes. It's a matter of a single click and it's much easier to, to deal with large projects. So part is uh, supporting just this, but with several uh, companies we are also working on such a communication interface. Yeah, just for your information, uh, this is a communication scheme um, where basically the DSP software tells us I have these and that devices with these capabilities and is focused then tells to the user, okay, you can create FIR filters of this size, of that size, and that many channels, and so on, and then can send them to the DSP software. And it's really fast. We can uh, easily equip a system uh, in less than a second. Okay, so uh, let me make uh, some concluding uh, remarks here. Um, in my view, and Quite a few people share this view. Um, the availability of FRR filters, massive computing power, and at the same time the availability of numerical optimization principles yeah, will give us um, a tremendous step forward in the design of sound systems in the future. It's already happening now, but that will be the future of sound systems. In five or ten years, in my view, there will be no linery anymore at least in the pro range, that cannot be steered, where there is no uh, uh, beam steering or similar processing at work, because it offers so much more flexibility and control and also much easier uh, system setup that this will be uh, the future. We consider that after the introduction of, of line arrays themselves, uh, FIR-based steering is the next evolutionary step. Yeah. The tuning and installation of loudspeaker systems is dramatically simplified, um, can be flexibly adapted to the venue and performance requirements. And at least our algorithms, Firmaker, are very fast. You can do uh, the, the, the optimization run in a few seconds, even for a system like a KH8 with 100 channels or something like that. Okay, yeah, Firmaker itself uh, works with newly designed systems, but all the pictures I've shown, they've been investigations from investigations where we've used already existing systems. Yeah? The Firmaker FIR filters in this sense can already be employed for existing systems, and that's why uh, the FIR capabilities are available not just for the KH8 at KRA but also for other systems which do not have uh, um, beam steering capabilities from the beginning. Uh, that's a big advantage um, because you can uh, even for an existing installation you can you can achieve better results. If you have a stadium with installed uh, line arrays maybe and there are complaints about speech intelligibility and now you go, go back to the modeling and you just uh, refine the system, you do a filmmaker optimization, you get FIR filters and you put them into the system. It doesn't have to be reinstalled, nothing has to be changed, just the DSP has to be loaded with, with FIR filters and you can increase your speech intelligibility, for example. I have shown the, the results for several line array systems where we have only one FIR channel per cabinet. It works very well. Uh, we are often asked, should we not have 
more channels per cabinet. Maybe we should have a resolution of FIR channels that's uh, in the frequency range of use, uh, the, the, the distribution over vertical length. And uh, all of our finding, also our theory, uh, says that that's not generally needed. Of course, you gain some more control at four or six kilohertz, but you have seen the results that we get with one FIR channel per cabinet. It remains to be seen if this this degree of control is really needed on top. In our view right now, it's not. Uh. So what, what about this exactly in one FIR per cabinet? Does it go into the whole range or is it yeah. in the cabinet? Yeah. So it contains multiple parameters for the whole range? Basically, one FIR channel per cabinet means you can have a, 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 an array of eight boxes and you use an eight-channel DSP matrix each uh, output channel has one FIR filter. That's it. Yeah. No, no uh, uh, frequency uh, splitting or anything like this. Now, for the special system, uh, the KH8, that's still something different. They are very large boxes where we need to have some spatial uh, divisioning. And there are also some other advantages with the special uh, arrangement of, of the, the KH8 system because it's not, uh, it's not forming a wavefront by itself where we need a higher resolution. Uh, but for conventional systems, for typical systems, here uh, a higher resolution than maybe 20, 30 centimeters per FIR channel is usually not needed. Right. You mentioned a thousand tap FIR filters. Is that the kind of uh, what you use in your little examples that you? Yeah, I uh, we've used a range of uh, 500 to 2,000 or so. It doesn't really matter, honestly speaking, because the the tap size primarily um, controls uh, the the frequency resolution towards the low frequencies, and that's on the line array side also controlled by the size of the line array. And we found that um, you could go down to 384 or even 256 taps and still have good control. You should not go below it. I also have some, not on this computer, uh, some slides. There is an AAS presentation about it too, where we in detail analyze the, the influence of the tap count. Yeah. So it doesn't, uh, we found that 500 or 1,000 taps is more than enough. It doesn't bring you anything to use 2,000, for example, or even 4,000. It just gives you more latency in the system. Right. Yeah. So that's a, the tap count and latency are related to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In your previous example, sorry. Sure. Related question about latency. Did you make a note of what the extra latency was having? Yeah, normally uh, Firmica, um, uh, of course, puts the uh, the peaks of the FIR filters, they look like impulse responses, really, um, within the FIR itself. That means uh, part of the uh, cabinets will have the peak early in the FIR, somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the end, and the average uh, uh, latency caused by the FIR is usually uh, half the tap count. Yeah, so for 500 taps, it's maybe, depending on 548 kilohertz or 96 kilohertz, maybe 5 milliseconds latency or something like that, yeah, roughly. So this latency is uniform throughout the frequency range. So the phase is unchanged. Or is it, I mean, the overall, if you were to take a transfer function of the whole array, and then you would need to bring the impulse response to, to zero, I mean, sync it with your loop, how much extra delay will it have? Five milliseconds? Or For example, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends a little and bit. Group delay would be unchanged, in other words. Mm. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. Of course, the, the phase of the, the entire system will change. We are manipulating the superposition of the individual elements by means of phase. That's the real power of the FIR not just being able to change the magnitude in detail, but also to change the phase of the radiating elements. And those are then combined in a way using the phase that 
across the venue, we have the optimal superposition. Uh, but then, in a given point, when you measure the performance of the whole array, all the sums phrases together, yes. is it going to make the phrase more rough, or is it going to straighten it, or is it going to keep it? Under? No, the, 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 the impulse responses that you measure are still compact. It actually, because of the optimization, they are often more compact than in the conventional case. Uh, initially, in our first tests with with professionals, many uh, uh, comments were the system sounds very uh, uh, dry, very um, sharp, yeah, because uh, they always had because of the different arrays, uh, elements of the array, they always had some distribution, some smearing of the arrival for a line array. Yeah, so uh, you don't have a, a very uh, clear arrival time for the conventional system. Now, due to the optimization, actually, it is pushed together and you have a much sharper attack. Yeah. So you still measure impulse responses as you did before. Of course, there will be some spread across the venue. You cannot, like in like for conventional systems, you can only uh, optimize uh, for a single point with regard to delay. That's still true here. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So the optimization is very fast. We are using some special math libraries. It doesn't take minutes or dozens of minutes, but just a few seconds. And it integrates directly with East Focus T, uh, East Focus 2, East Focus 3 is, uh, will be released in a few weeks, and uh, support to come for East, East EVAC, and SysTune. Patents are pending. We are already have applied for patents some years ago. But I should also say uh, some general words. Um, <clears throat> we are not the first to generally invent this scheme of uh, optimizing FRR filters. The very first uh, have been uh, Duran already in the late 90s, Duran Audio, maybe some of you know this, even for uh, Turing uh, line array systems, the target system, they've uh, derived optimal FRR filters, but still with very small tap counts. And we did uh, mechanical optimization with play angles already in the early 2000s. That's where we are coming from. And then later on, uh, the products that you now hear about, which are obviously working quite well, but uh, they, they came uh, later on. Uh, the Martin uh, MLA or the, the EAW or the DNB uh, nowadays, uh, they all seem to use similar principles. Okay, I've mentioned, oh, we've covered all of this already, thanks to your questions. And uh, yeah, summarizing, the Firmica was launched two years ago, almost three soon, and it was a big success for us, and I think it was also a big success for the, the companies that use this, especially also KRA, and uh, I should stretch that, um, with KRA, the first newly designed system, the KH8, uh, was brought to life with the Firmaker implementation. Um, and uh, this system is also the first that uses optimization for um, multiple ways, uh, for the low and the high frequencies. And uh, up to date, I believe there is no other system using this yet. Okay, feel free to, to visit our website. Uh, we certainly have the, the uh, possibility to chat later on as well. There are, we have uh, white papers about Firmaker and there's also an AS paper about this and uh, we'll be happy to, to answer your questions as well. So, thank you very much. <laughs>